Barbed wire, bruises, and blood. Lots and lots of blood. Our cameras go on to the front lines of ultra wrestling. I'm concerned about getting seriously injured. It's like I don't want to end up in a wheelchair. Plus, gaming legend Richard Garriott takes a $30 million trip into space. No one is willing to tell you practical issues with going to the bathroom in space. I, on the other hand, I'm willing to share the secrets. It's all just ahead as G4 goes underground. I'm Morgan Webb, and this is G4 Underground, where we take you places no one else will go. In the 80s, when pro wrestling went mainstream with comic book-like melodrama, a hardcore alternative began to emerge. Among the most intense and bloody leagues is CZW, Combat Zone Wrestling, where a typical match can involve barbed wire, panes of glass, and a trip to the hospital. Now, there's little glory and even less money. So why do these guys risk life and limb? Why I would do this to my body is a question that I've received uh, ever since I began. I guess there's a, there's a compulsion in me to shock people. I, I don't know why, but I just, I'm compelled to seek out that shock value. I'm always nervous. But as soon as you walk through the curtain and you, you, know, the, you get the crowd behind you, you just fall into it and it feels good. My name is Danny Havoc. And I am an American independent professional deathmatch wrestler. Rob Tap, what's going on, brother? Not much, man. Hey, listen, I'm coming in on Wednesday at uh, 8:22. Can you pick me up? Yeah. All right, dude. And we'll uh, we'll hit up. We'll, we'll get wings that night. We can get all kinds of drunk. It'll be excellent. I was about 13 years old. I'd been interested in martial arts films as a youth and uh, action films of that sort. And then I saw the whole new kind of wrestling that I wasn't aware of, where people were. Uh, choreographing some pretty extreme violence. All of a sudden, I was hooked. Fire has been used on a number of occasions. They've gone so far as to use things like weed whackers, um, razor blades, hypodermic needles. You still feel bad for the guys who lose their teeth, but you understand that this is something that might happen. I don't think all the blood's gonna come out of this, babe. It's been sitting for a few days, and this is pretty extensive. Yeah, you're right, actually, that's pretty gross. I'm concerned about getting seriously injured, of course, like I don't want to end up in a wheelchair. But the cuts, the bruises, the scars, it really doesn't bother me. For some reason, I just, I'm, I'm proud of it, you know? Definitely less comfortable doing what I do now that I've lost health insurance. I, I do this because I love to do it, and Obviously, it's a huge risk every time you go out there. Um, I just hope that I don't have to uh, reap the consequences of that risk anytime soon. This is the kind of match that's gonna have a lot of violence, but it's relatively safe in the fact that like cuts, you know, they heal. Yeah, but Scotty got his jaw broken twice. Like, that's... A well, pretty major expense. I Scotty, mean, I know he Scotty didn't... Scotty should not have pissed Dylan off. Scotty deserved that. Yeah. Didn't you say that some companies actually do offer insurance? No. Yeah. It's not going to happen. American Deathmatch wrestling promotions are notoriously run by two-faced scumbags who, uh, they're just not, not going to pay for that. Probably the 
aspect of wrestling that I'm most disturbed by is all the guys bleeding on each other. Um, obviously, they don't get tested for diseases ahead of time. Now, I like a lot of the guys that you wrestle with, you know, but I don't <laughs> know their backstory or where they've been or what they've been doing. And all. I, I don't have the head. So you don't. good news all around. True, but I mean, that scares me more than you jumping off something and breaking some bones. Honestly, I don't like that part of it. This weekend I will be squaring off against a gentleman from Germany by the name of Thumbtack Jack. And he's gonna challenge me for the ultraviolet underground title. Yeah. Be taking off, baby. I'm gonna miss you. Miss you too. Be good. I'll give you call as soon as okay? matches over, alright? Alright. All right. Careful, honey. Yeah, I will. I love you. Nice, love you too, babe. Good luck. Nice. <laughs> My biggest fear is that he'll get terribly hurt. I would just be devastated if anything ever happened to him. There's a lot of pressure on this match. If this is a great performance, it could skyrocket me to the next level. And if it's lackluster, then, um, then maybe this is as high as I go. Coming up. Thumbtack Jack is a very good competitor. He's a crazy SOB. And later... NASA won't call me an astronaut. Gaming legend Richard Garriott tells us about how he made it into space after NASA said no way. I was saying, like, well, wait a minute, you can't tell me, you know, I can't go. Next on G4 Underground. Wrestling is perceived by the public to be fake. I don't think that I'm exposing anything that isn't common knowledge by saying that there are elements of wrestling which are fake. It's an exhibition rather than a competition. But anything that you see in the ring with us is very much real. Finger caught between the chair and the <laughs> mat. Took a big piece of beef out of it. it happens. I ain't nothing I can do about it. My name is Thumbtack Jack, and I'm from Germany. And this is my second time over here in the United States of America. And I'm gonna compete with Danny Havoc. I've wrestled him before, and basically what happened there was me sticking a syringe into his arm and beating that poor mother. Thumbtack Jab is a very good competitor, and he's a crazy SOB. It's just very important that I not only win this match, but just have a tremendous performance there. We're there to entertain the fans rather than to win the match. This is the biggest match I've done in my career. I've got bookings riding on this. I've got money on DVDs and everything else. What a crazy son of a bitch! A lot on the line. A lot riding on this. So I really need to hit it home. When you're in the match, you're worried about not getting hurt, remembering what you were gonna do, and being able to take the punishment and continue to the end point. That's kind of what this game is all about, is how much punishment can you take. I feel like 
there's a certain element of the population that is really interested in watching other people take uh, a lot of punishment. And I'm just better than some at taking said punishment. are crazy. They want violence and uh, they can tell if you're faking it. Thankfully, I've never been in a position where I haven't been able to take all the punishment that was required of me to get to the end, but uh, sometimes it's closed. Every time I finish a match, the first thing that goes through my head is, did I put on a good show? The second thing that goes through my head is, uh, thank God I'm not going out in an ambulance. I'm 22 years old. Now I'm at the very top of hardcore wrestling. I don't know how many more matches I've got left in me, but I just gotta keep fighting as long as I can. There's something in me that makes me want more. Danny told us that Thumbtack Jack may have broken his ribs during the match, but Thumbtack refused to get an x-ray to confirm this. Richard Garriott is a legendary gamer, an entrepreneur, and a radical adventurer. He's most famous for creating the Ultima games. And just recently, he spent 30 million to take the ultimate trip into space. He invited our cameras into his castle to chat about his adventures, and he's giving us a special advance look at an upcoming documentary on his space trip. All the footage from space that you're about to see, Garriott shot himself. NASA won't call me an astronaut. They really don't like anybody encroaching on the term astronaut, which I think is ridiculous. But their, their term for someone like me is the wonderfully eloquent space flight participant. If you want to do me any favors, make sure that anytime any tagline shows up under my name, it includes the word astronaut, preferably with a capital A. I've been trying to find my way into space since I was really quite young. My father was a NASA astronaut, and so I grew up in a town believing that everyone was going to have the opportunity to go to space because everyone I knew did go to space. But uh, when I was a teenager, one of the NASA physicians told me that my poor eyesight was going to prevent me from ever being selected as a NASA astronaut. And while prior to that moment, I wouldn't have said that I was devoted to growing up to getting into space, after that moment, I was saying like, well, wait a minute, you can't tell me, you know, I can't go. I was fully intending and expecting to be the first private citizen in space, and that's when the internet stock market bubble burst, and so with it went all my wealth. And then I had to go cycle back, uh, rebuild my wealth. That's what I've been working to achieve for you know, decades. In my mind, there is an extraordinary overlap between the uh, creative work that I do in creating virtual worlds and exploring virtual worlds and quest uh, of exploring the reality that we, in which we live, including traveling to space. Fundamentally, I really do think of myself as a storyteller. My games are absolutely a, one of my principal outlets for storytelling. I would say my other biggest outlet for storytelling is this house. I call my house Britannia Manor, and of course that comes out of Lord British and the world of Britannia that I've built as uh, the fictitious world that the Ultimates are set in. You know, one of my greatest joys in life is bringing people to this house. And it's because this is where I've collected my stories. I mean, everything you see in this house, it's all stuff you can walk up to and play with, just like I had the joy of doing. And, you know, nothing that's in my house was purchased for its investment value or resale value. It was all acquired for its story value. And so some of my favorite things are incredibly cheap, and some of my favorite things just happen to have been expensive. But, uh, but in either case, the real value to me is the kind of story that I can tell that's behind it. 
Even once you make the decision to go to space, and even if you have the large sum of money required to go into space, uh, there's still quite a bit uh, that has to be done. The, the year of, say, 2007, uh, I spent mostly doing medical tests and making sure that I would be approved for flight medically. Then for almost all of 2008, I spent most of my time in Star City, Russia, outside of Moscow, training for the flight. And I trained in the exact same classes and to the exact same fundamental skill level as all other astronauts and cosmonauts. So I'm, I'm truly a, a fully qualified astronaut or cosmonaut. The hours before launch were quite interesting. You go through a couple of hours of what I'll call checklists, starting with powering it up and then configuring the vehicle for launch. And then there's about a 45 minute period of time with literally nothing to do. And so, you know, like sitting here, you know, we're kind of all looking over at each other going like, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. You know, this, it's for real this time. And what was really funny is that uh, over our headsets for mission control, when they all heard us talking about the fact that, you know, we're even kind of running out of things to talk about, uh, they began to pipe over uh, what I would describe as elevator music. And for me, it just seemed like this amazing irony that here we are about to take our elevator ride into the heavens, and we're now listening to, you know, Muzak on the, on the headsets. 10, 9, 8, you get to the, you know, the final phases of the countdown, and, you know, at about three seconds, you begin to feel the vehicle come to life. Uh, when you get to zero and the vehicle begins to rise, it, it was completely different than I expected. It's actually, uh, it's very smooth, it's very elegant. It just lifts off the ground very gently, very comfortably, and then rises faster and faster, like I would describe it as this really elegant ballet where you are just lifted into the sky. And, uh, and it was actually extremely beautiful, uh, you know, not at all scary. Um, and then once the engine's cut off, the vehicle begins to tumble, and you get your first view of the Earth out the window. And even your first view out of the window is phenomenal. You, get, you can see the uh, curvature of the Earth, the black sky above it, and the thin veil of the atmosphere clinging to it. And immediately the Earth begins to feel what I would describe as smaller. I signed up for a extremely heavy, what you might call workload, on my very expensive vacation. Even though I'm you know, a, a self-paid flyer in space, the scientific and commercial and educational work that I did in space is at least on par with any other professional astronaut on the similar 12-day mission profile. Coming up. No one is willing to tell you the practical issues with going to the bathroom in space. Richard Garriott spent 12 days on the International Space Station. It's a trip that took him decades to accomplish. He tells us firsthand what it was like, including the kind of details NASA leaves out of the official mission report. I find it very funny that one of the most common questions that kids ask astronauts is, how do you go to the bathroom in space? But I can also tell you, that the most common dinner conversations amongst astronauts and cosmonauts before flight, how do you go to the bathroom in space? Everyone else's description is completely superficial. I, on the other hand, am willing to share the secrets. Liquid wastes are actually not too much of a problem. You actually are basically urinating into a vacuum funnel. Solid waste disposal, however, is a much more interesting problem. Here on Earth, if you were to, for example, go over your sink with a tube of toothpaste, gravity, after you had a certain amount of toothpaste out of the toothpaste tube, would take over and pull a piece of this toothpaste into the sink. But if you were going to use the same experiment in space where there's no gravity, and you were to begin to squeeze toothpaste out of a tube, you would just get a longer and longer and longer and longer and longer stream of toothpaste. And the problem is that if you try to stand up or move away, you will pull things out of the uh, toilet with you. To make a long story short and, and skip over the most graphic parts of it, you basically then have to use toilet paper and rubber gloves to continue to you know, keep things uh, uh, clear. And, uh, and so this process, you know, here on Earth, you know, this process may take a couple minutes, is really a 30 to 45 minute job just because of the, what I'll call the logistical challenges to successfully accomplishing this in a non-hazardous way. You know, people have often asked me that, you know, now that you've been to space, you know, what's left? And I'm going, 
Well, you know, the reality in which we live is vast. Uh, you know, there's still tons of areas of the earth that I've not explored. There's tons of areas under the sea that have yet to be explored. Um, and it's true that I really did spend you know, most of my wealth to go do this. It wasn't a question of, hey, I've got some money. What might I go spend it on? It was really, I have this goal of getting into space. It's going to be very expensive. Can I earn enough to pull it off? And I did. And I absolutely would do it again. Darian has announced that he plans to go into space again and is leaving the developer of his latest game, Tabula Rasa, to pursue space-related ventures and help further the privatization of space travel so one day we can all experience it for ourselves. I'm Morgan Webb. I'll see you next time on G4 Underground.